Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. Whatever time you're watching this, I hope you're doing well. I hope you're taking care of yourself, have had your dinner or any kind of meals that you're supposed to have and uh, drinking enough amount of water, taking part in extracurriculars, doing well in your studies, not troubling people around you. And if you are not doing so well, it's all right. Um, after some time, you will start feeling well. Because once you're down, the only way that you can go is up. All right. So today we shall be talking about this topic, which is natural vegetation and wildlife. Now, um, it's again a very interesting topic. I mean, everything that you study is interesting as long as you know um, where to go, how to go, how to deal with it, how to navigate through the topics and understand basically what it uh, entails, what it try, what it is trying to te teach you more uh, specifically. I don't know how many of you watch Discovery or uh, National Geographic or anything of those channels or uh, shows like that or if they interest you in any way. But if that's the case, this is something that will interest you. And if it does not, uh, it's all right, you still have to study it. Uh, but to have a better understanding of these uh, topics, you can always go back and, uh, you know, when you're watching television or um, these days web series or in documentaries on Netflix or anywhere out there. Just um, log into channels, go into channels which uh, provide you knowledge about these things because uh, not only are you learning something new and through a visual media you are able to understand it better even though i will be talking about it i will be uh, you know you have your the ppt in front of you and there are certain points about certain types of um, vegetation certain certain types of forests the thing that matters is that you retain it okay uh, and how does that how can you do that? You can use various methods and one of the ways is to visually understand it better. Okay, so here we go ahead and uh, I hope you have your pens ready. I hope you have your notebooks ready and uh, you're ready to take any notes that you might miss out. Um, so yes, let's do it. Natural vegetation and wildlife. Introduction. Natural vegetation refers to the plant, plant life that grows without human intervention. What is natural vegetation? It refers to the plant life that grows without human intervention in a particular region. So any life, like any kind of uh, plant life that grows out without human intervention as in agriculture okay so we talk about agriculture agriculture basically requires human intervention otherwise it's not agriculture because it involves uh, sowing of seeds and it involves uh, taking care of those seeds uh, irrigation sorry those plants when those seeds turn into plants irrigating the field or using various uh, pesticides fertilizers and stuff like that and later uh, harvesting the produce that is um, you know that they receive so uh, that is basically agriculture. But when it comes to natural vegetation, it is specific and it's necessary that there is no kind of human intervention in uh, a natural vegetation growing. If there is a human intervention, then that is not considered natural vegetation. It includes forests, grasslands, deserts, tundra, etc. Wildlife refers to the animals, birds and other living organisms found in their natural habitat. So what is the difference between, um, let's say, the dog who is a domestic at your house and what is the difference between a dog which runs out in the wild and has like, you know, was in a natural habitat or uh, a bear who lives in the forests. What is, okay, what is basically the difference? Okay, this is something that will let you know it better. So what is basically the difference between uh, animals which are kept in the zoo and animals which are um, out there in the forests, out there in the actually natural vegetation. So uh, this is the difference that one of them is in the zoo. It's not in its natural habitat, even if they create those environments for the uh, animal to survive. You know, penguins have these ice gaps and all of this. And uh, for uh, beards, they have caves. Uh, in the enclosures but that is not considered wildlife as such because what 
defines this difference it is the fact that they are still living in a society which does not belong to them like which is not their natural habitat a zoo is not a natural habitat of any animal a zoo uh, a forest a grassland a desert is where uh, an animal belongs a particular you know area from where it actually hails from a zoo is not a natural is not a natural habitat and hence the um animals living there are not considered wildlife so when we talk about natural vegetation we to also talk about the wildlife there because uh, natural vegetation and wildlife are close together in this term okay uh, it's like you could say one depends on the other as well um though wildlife though wildlife wildlife depends more on the natural vegetation than the other way around flora flora refers to the plant life found in a particular region it includes trees shrubs herbs grasses and other vegetation types fauna fauna refers to the animal life found in a particular region it includes mammals birds reptiles amphibians fish and invertebrates so uh, what is flora flora is the plant life found in a particular region and fauna is the uh, animal life found in a particular region okay factors influencing the type and distribution of natural vegetation and wildlife so there are certain factors which influence okay so uh, how does a particular uh, area have this particular type of natural vegetation um something that we'll study in a while so we talk about uh, tropical rainforests and we talk about um you know desert climate desert forests or arid forests so how does this come about that while one area has tropical rainforests in this meantime the other area has uh, arid or desert type of forest area so this is basically uh, designed this is basically decided by various factors and now we shall be going ahead and reading through what these factors are and understanding how these basically decide the uh vegetation or uh, the wildlife in that particular area in that particular region okay climate temperature and rainfall are the primary climatic factors that influence natural vegetation and wildlife so climate when it comes to climate there are two factors temperature and rainfall which are the primary climatic factors that influence natural vegetation and wildlife different types of vegetation and wildlife are adapted to specific temperature ranges and rainfall patterns yes so basically um yeah so basically te- uh, according to the temperature that is there the pressure will be decided accordingly the winds will flow and accordingly rainfall patterns will develop in that certain area and in this in turn will create a climate which is specific to that area all right so all these uh, because of the temperature because of the rainfall pattern different types of vegetations are used to different types of area and accordingly different types of wildlife are used to different type of area okay tropical rainforests uh, tropical rainforests thrive in areas with high temperature and heavy rainfall so tropical rainforests are found in areas with high temperature and heavy rainfall while deserts have low precipitation and extreme temperature variations all right so uh, while this is an example of climate while tropical rainforests have high temperature and heavy rainfall in the same time desert um deserts have low precipitation precipitation and high variation in temperature because of this because of which actually because of which in tropical rainforests a uh, variety of vegetation is found variety of wildlife is found but in deserts only certain varieties of plants and animals are able to adapt themselves to the environment and hence can grow in those particular conditions 
Okay, all right. Let's move ahead. Topography. The physical features. What is a topo? What is topography? What do you mean when we say topography? It's a. It is the physical features of the land, such as altitude, slope, and relief, influence the type and distribution of natural vegetation and wildlife. So topography is basically how the land looks in a certain area. Is the land steep? Is the land uh, deep? Is the land shall you know is the land uh, plain is it elevated so all these things also decide the kind of uh, vegetation and wildlife a area has so you the physical features in this topography that are um, necessary as wait, altitude that is the height basically if we talk about an you know um basic terms and layman terms slope is basically how it is like how much elevation is there or how low it is or how high only slightly elevated it is so it's like either mountains or plains or plateaus relief is how the land looks like how what does the land have does it have plain structure does it have a steep um, or a rugged structure or does the land have uh, rivers on it or something or the other okay higher altitudes generally have colder temperatures leading to the growth of coniferous forests while lower altitudes may support deciduous or tropical trees now another example of uh, we have for the factor that we have the second factor is topography and what example do we have that at higher altitudes generally there uh, there are colder temperatures which leads to the growth of coniferous forests which do not require uh, much water or which do not require uh, higher temperature basically okay while lower altitudes may support deciduous or tropical forests while as you come lower in the slope in the altitude what happens is that uh, the areas support deciduous or tropical forests soil Soil fertility, composition, and moisture content impact the growth of vegetation and subsequently the presence of wildlife. So, in an area, if the soil fertility is well, if the composition of soil is well, if the moisture content is also moderate, and you know as much as the soil requires or the crops or the natural vegetation of that area requires, the natural vegetation will thrive, and in turn, the wildlife will also thrive. Okay. Uh, but if the soil fertility is low, if the composition uh, is not well, if there are not enough amount of nutrients, if the moisture content is very low or very high, so it's not something that is suitable to the uh, to certain kind of vegetation, to all kind of vegetation actually. So only very uh, small amount of very less varied amount of vegetation will be found in that area, and in turn the wildlife will also be subsequently less varied. Different types of soils favor specific plant species, which in turn attract particular wildlife. For example, well-drained and fertile soils support diverse vegetation and attract a variety of herbivores, which in turn sustain carnivorous species. So you see, everything in the ecosystem. What is the ecosystem? It's the envi environment that you live in. Everything in the ecosystem is dependent on one or the other thing. So it's uh, so basically even you you talk about soil fertility, then. Uh, by soil fertility you also talk about the plants of that area which is the natural vegetation of that area or even in terms of agriculture the crops that grow during that you know in that particular region and which in turn when you talk about uh, you know when you talk about uh, natural vegetation so then you in turn also talk about the favor the plant species and then these plant species which certain which call to certain herbivores or a large amount of herbivores and if an area if an area has a large amount of uh, herbivores then that particular area will also attract a large amount of carnivorous species and hence there will be variety in the uh, kind of um, wildlife and plant life that is interacting with each other okay so it's all dependent on one or the uh, on each other human activities human activities such as deforestation urbanization agriculture and pollution significantly impact natural vegetation and wildlife deforestation destroys habitats and disrupts ecosystem leading to the loss of biodiversity so human activities human is humans are always intervening everywhere okay basically that's that's like the basic thing that we are doing um 
if we uh, so one one thing is about humanity is that it's never cured in its curiosity to know more so basically if you want to or create more or want more or want to build more something or the other uh, humans as a whole want to do something or the other they want to unravel the mysteries of the world so they go and nag a certain region again and again until they know the secrets to that particular area all right so in that turn they are doing uh, what we basically indulge in our deforestation urbanization agriculture and pollution which significantly affects uh, the natural vegetation and wildlife so deforestation is basically cutting down of trees rapid cutting down of trees which leads to uh, an unrest in the social Oh, sorry in the ecosystem and uh, it destroys habitats and it disrupts the ecosystem leading to the loss of biodiversity if there is a less amount of trees there will be less amount of wildlife which usually sustains on trees and hence there will be a disruption in the way the ecosystem functions there will be less amount of herbivores or there will be less amount of birds and which will lead to less amount of certain other animals and hence the food chain will be affected and the, hence the food web will be affected so it's even if it's like a small looks like a small let's say 1 km of area 1 km radius of a forest was cut off so can you imagine the loss which which to hum, humans it seems small maybe the it was like a you know let's say it was like a 50 km radius of uh, the forest and only 1 km was cut so even though it small looks like a small area compared to the 50 km that is still there 49 km that is still there but uh, this that 1 km of diversity in organisms has been lost okay so it's uh, things like this pollution in including air water and soil pollution can negatively affect both flora and fauna so pollution does not have good effects on any one pollution only brings bad luck on the other hand conservation efforts afforestation and wildlife sanctuaries help protect and preserve natural vegetation and wildlife so there have been conservation efforts there have there has been afforestation i mean these are things that people uh, constantly there are certain organization and there are certain amount of people who are constantly uh, talking about these things and you know trying to make that happen so these are basically things which preserve or protect the natural vegetation and wildlife next up okay all right so these are also things uh, one is temperature and humidity temperature uh, is as i talked about in climate uh, different vegetation and wildlife are adapted to specific temperature ranges and tropical rainforests in humid and uh, hot climates and coniferous forests in cold regions all right humidity moist regions support dense forests and diverse wildlife while arid regions favor de desert vegetation and adapted wildlife photo period what is photo period photo period refers to daylight and darkness in a 24 hour cycle so it's like this is the amount of time that uh, sun is shown in this particular region and this is the amount of time it is not so this also affects the plant growth the flowering and hence also the wildlife behavior because the wildlife gets accustomed to a certain amount of uh, you know sun's presence or sun's exposure and uh, later not expo exposure so uh, deciduous forests shedding leaves in winter and animals migrating in response to photo period are certain examples that are observed when we say that factors like photo period affect the natural vegetation and wildlife precipitation precipitation rainfall and snowfall determines vegetation and wildlife distribution high rainfall supports tropical forests moderate rainfall sustains grasslands and low precipitation characterizes deserts with specialized wildlife so the wildlife also becomes adapted to the region from where it uh, from where it or like you know where the particular community of animals is living a particular uh, i'd say group of animals is living so it adapts itself over the course of years to be able to uh, habitate in that particular environment tropical evergreen forests 
Tropical evergreen forests, also known as rainforests, are okay. So we we will now go on to types of forests. First is tropical evergreen forests, and they are also known as rainforests, which are characterized by high rainfall throughout the year and dense vegetation. We have talked about them multiple times before in this lecture, uh, and we are talking that they need high temperature, high rainfall. So tropical evergreen forests, also known as rainforests, are characterized by high rainfall throughout the year and dense vegetation. these forests are found in regions with high humidity and temperatures such as the western ghats northeast india and parts of the andaman and nicobar islands they are known for their tall closely packed trees with broad leaves that form a dense canopy blocking sunlight from reaching the forest floor so where are they find first of all they are found in areas of high humidity and temperatures so try to remember which area receives the most rainfall in india it's northeastern regions and western ghats so it means these areas do have a uh, what just a minute it means let's write this properly we we can you know this is how all of geography is con connected so it's like high rainfall observed where western ghats and north east india <laughs> so these are areas which are booming in uh, tropical evergreen forests and also there are parts of andaman nicobar islands of course because that's where the southwest monsoon also goes by uh, they are known for their to tall closely packed trees so the trees are tall and they are closely packed and they have broad leaves and hence it so happens that because of forming a dense canopy canopy is basically trees coming together to form a roof and uh, they block sunlight from reaching the forest floor the forest floor receives very less uh, sunlight tropical evergreen forests support high biodiversity with a variety of plant and animal species including numerous epiphytes and lianas tropical moist deciduous forests so uh, there's tropical evergreen and there are deciduous forests amongst which there are moist deciduous forests and there are dry deciduous forests we shall be studying them differently tropical moist deciduous forests are found in areas with a distinct wet and dry season so the area has a distinct wet and dry season that is for some period of time that's it's uh, it rains over there or, and over some period of time it's completely without rain These forests are characterized by a mix of evergreen and deciduous trees which shed their leaves during the dry season to conserve water. Why does the shedding take place during the dry season to conserve water? They are found in regions like the central and eastern parts of India including Deccan Plateau and the Gangetic Plains. <coughs> so where are they found? Uh, in regions like central and eastern parts of Asia. of sorry india including the deccan plateau and the gangetic plains the vegetation in these forests is less dense compared to tropical rainforests allowing sunlight to reach the forest floor fostering the growth of shrubs and grasses so shrubs and grasses are less in the tropical evergreen forests but over here since uh, in a moist deciduous forest since the the forest is less dense then the sunlight can reach the floor and shrubs and grasses are seen here tropical dry deciduous forests experience a longer dry season with less rainfall compared to tropical moist deciduous forests so there is less rainfall when compared to tropical moist deciduous forests these forests are found in drier regions of india such as the northern plains and parts of western ghats so certain parts of western ghats that is you know uh, that is the <coughs> leeward side of the mountains the side which does not face the ocean or the sea uh, that side is basically where uh, these forests are found the trees in these forests shed their leaves during the dry season to conserve water and the vegetation becomes sparser thorny bushes and shrubs are also common in these forests which are adapted to the arid conditions dry or arid forests dry forests also known as arid forests uh, i'm sorry oh uh, yeah are found in extremely dry regions with minimal rainfall such as the thar desert and parts of gujarat and rajasthan 
where are they found thar desert and parts of gujarat and rajasthan vegetation in these forests is adapted to withstand drought and extreme heat that is what i've been saying that forests and vegetation and uh, wildlife uh, starts to adapt themselves to the kind of temperature and environment that they're living in so vegetation in this forest is adapted to withstand drought and extreme heat characterized by thorny shrubs succulents and xerophytic xerophytic uh, plants the trees in dry forests are usually short and widely spaced to maximize water ability animals in these forests have unique adaptation to survive in arid conditions such as nocturnal behavior and efficient water conserving mechanisms you must have heard of the hump of the canal where it conserves water where it stores water okay mountainous forests or himalayan forests mountainous forests also known as himalayan forests are found in the foothills and higher altitudes of the himalayan range <coughs> These forests exhibit variations in vegetation based on elevation, ranging from subtropical forests in the lower regions to temperate and alpine forests at higher elevations. So the thing is, it depends on the elevation, and uh, accordingly, mountainous forests have different kind of vegetable vegetation that adapts to that particular slope, particular altitude, particular temperature. Himalayan forests are known for their diverse tree species, including oak, uh, fir, cedar, and rhododendron. dendron these forests provide important ecological services such as water regulation soil conservation and habitat for a variety of wildlife including the elusive snow leopard and red panda so they are home to snow leopard and red panda okay wildlife various forms of life including animals birds insects and aquatic creatures are part of natural vegetation and wildlife they provide us with essential products such as milk meat hides wool and honey insects like bees play a vital role in pollination and act as decomposers in ecosystem among mammals elephants are known for their majestic presence are and are primarily found in hot wet forests of assam karnataka and kerala One horned rhinoceros inhabit swampy and marshy lands in Assam and West Bengal. India is the only country that is home to both tigers and lions. Indian lions are primarily found in the Gir forest of Gujarat, while tigers are uh, inhabit forests in Madhya Pradesh, the Sundarbans of Western Bengal and Himalayan regions. So, while lions are found in Gir forest of Gujarat, uh, tigers are found in Madhya Pradesh, Sundarbans and Himalayan regions. National parks are protected areas owned by the government safeguarded against human exploitation industrialization and pollution so what are national parks they are protected areas which are owned by government to safeguard against human exploitation industrialization and pollution wildlife sanctuaries are natural areas reserved by government so these are also areas which are reserved by government or private but this could also be uh you know reserved by a private agency to protect specific animal species while hunting and fishing other prohibited or strictly uh, sorry while uh, with hunting and fishing either prohibited or strictly controlled biosphere reserves biosphere reserves are dedicated areas set aside for conserving the resources of the biosphere supporting long term scientific research and education okay so wildlife conservation in india so there are various ways that why the indian government has tried to raise certain projects or certain um, endeavors through which wildlife can be protected and uh, can be conserved and in this there's project bustard in 2012 the indian government launched project bustard a national conservation program to protect the great indian bustard along with the belgian florican the lesser florican and their habitats for from further declines so project bustard was launched in 2012 by the indian government and it aims to protect the great indian bustard which is which is a picture picture right over here along with but there's another two species which are which also come under this uh, project which is bengal florican the le and the lesser florican bengal florican the lesser florican and Uh, the great indian bustard so these are uh, the three species who needs protection from declining further and uh, who need to be protected uh, and with along with the habitat that they live in project tiger which was launched in 1973 it was to protect and conserve the endangered bengal tigers and their habitats across india 
Project Elephant implemented for the conservation and management of elephants and their habitats, addressing issues like human elephant conflict and habitat fragmentation. Project Snow Leopard, which was launched in 2009, aimed at conserving the endangered snow leopard and its high altitude habitats in the Himalayan region. Project Hangul initiated to conserve the endangered Kashmiri stag, also known as the Hangular Kashmiri red deer. Found in the Dachi Gum National Park in surrounding areas of Na Jammu and Kashmir. Project Vulture, launched in 20 2006, aims to conserve the critically endangered vulture species in India, mainly addressing the threats of habitat loss and the use of veterinary drugs that are harmful to vultures. So, basically, what is the crux of these uh, few names that we learned is that we are striving to not let any kind of wildlife species go extinct because of inhabitable conditions or because of uh, not having enough uh, amount of water or anything as such so that you know the diversity maintains major grasslands grasslands are vast areas of land characterized by the dominant presence of grasses rather than trees or shrubs they exist in various parts of the world and play a cr critical role in supporting diverse ecosystems Types of grasslands. Savanna grasslands found in tropical and subtropical regions with a mix of grasses and scattered trees. Prairie glass grasslands located in North America featuring tall grasses and moderate rainfall. Pampas grassland primarily found in South America known for their flat plains and fertile soils. Steppy grasslands spanning temperate regions characterized by shorter grasses and semi-arid conditions. Alpine grasslands as the name suggests high altitude grasslands in mountainous areas adapted to cold and harsh environment. Tundra is arctic grasslands found in cold regions with a short growing season. So if it so happens that you are able to visit any of these grasslands, you could because we have the information for all of them. Okay, so basically let's uh, talk about a little about the life in deserts. Uh, how it is and how people survive living in a desert and how are people able to cope with that entire thing okay life in deserts deserts are harsh and arid environments characterized by extreme temperatures sparse vegetation and limited water availability desert plants have evolved unique adaptations to conserve water and tolerate extreme temperatures so desert, deserts are harsh and arid environments and there the temperature fluctuates a lot it will be very hot in the afternoon and very cold uh, later on so deserts plant desert plants have evolved uh, unique adaptations to conserve water and tolerate extreme temperatures examples of desert plants include cacti succulents and shrubs with thick waxy coatings, reduced leaves and deep root systems. Nocturnal behavior is common among desert animals to avoid the scorching daytime heat. So, uh, yeah, there, there are reasons for the various adaptations that have been made in the vegetation or in the wildlife. Many desert animals such as camels and kangaroo rats are equipped with efficient water conserving mechanisms. Some desert organisms enter a state of dormancy uh, such such as estivation or hibernation during extreme conditions. Many desert animals are well camouflaged, blending with the sandy or rocky surroundings to avoid predators. Many desert communities follow a nomadic or semi-nomadic lifestyle, moving with their livestock in search of water and grazing lands. Water is a precious resource in desert areas and communities have developed innovative water management techniques despite there being less to no water and being like less rainfall. But communities have still developed systems to wat manage water. Rainwater harvesting cisterns and water storage techniques are also employed to maximize water availability. So there have been various methods which have been used to maximize water availability. Now over here is a cold desert. We have heard about deserts where it's very hot, very cold. But when there are deserts which are covered by snow throughout the year. Cold desert plants have evolved to withstand freezing temperatures, strong winds and limited water availability. Examples of cold desert plants include low-growing shrubs, lichens, mosses and grasses. These plants have adaptations such as deep root systems, small leaves and waxy coatings to conserve water and reduce water loss. Cold desert food chains that um, start with primary producers like lichens and mosses 
and later are grazed gray gay you know which are grazed upon by herbivores like musk oxen and reindeer so uh, while this is the vegetation that grows there the wildlife over there lives upon it predators like wolves and snow leopards rely on their herbivores for the subsistence sustenance so they meanwhile herbivores rely on lichens and mosses so they rely on these herbivores who are eating this uh, to fulfill their um, stomach Traditional lifestyles, livelihoods in cold deserts often involve hunting and fishing as a primary means of subsistence. So, in cold deserts, hunting as well as fishing is considered primary means of subsistence, and this is how we will live through it. Indigenous communities rely on hunting marine animals like seals, whales, and walruses, as well as fishing for fish purposes adapted to cold waters. So, uh, what the communities which have been living here for a long amount of time feel is that they. hunt on the marine animals and they make fishes so to adapt to the cold waters they rely on herding livestock like yaks and goats which are well suited to the harsh environment and provide essential resources so they herd livestock like yaks and goats they have a thick fur coat and hence they are used to this kind of environment and this harsh environment or they will get used to it because of the same and in the same meantime they also provide uh, essential nutrients essential resources like milk and meat when required so uh, this is the basically they are herded in cold desert areas so with this we come to an end of this chapter this topic i must say natural vegetation and wildlife uh, soon we shall follow with an example lecture where i assume you guys listen to me carefully if you did not you were making notes that's well as well if you did not listen to me carefully go back and listen to it again study it again because you did not the first time so uh, yes with this i shall take your leave uh, take care and thank you so much for watching